Hi, I'm Harut Markarian, and this is Mobility and Inclusion, the show where we share the powerful stories of people with disabilities and daring entrepreneurs making waves in our world. From technological innovations to best practices in business, we'll learn what it really means to live in an inclusive and universally designed environment. Welcome, everyone. This is Mobility and Inclusion. I am Harut Markarian, and our guest today is... Annette Ramirez. At age 48, Annette went into the hospital for a hysterectomy. During the surgery, the surgeon unknowingly sliced her bowel. Diligent post-operative care would have revealed that problem, but the nurses overlooked her abnormal vital signs. Her doctors failed to follow up to check her condition after the surgery. The result in a failure to diagnose her condition led to the amputation of her arms and legs, as well as the excision of flesh from multiple areas of her body. Annette? Welcome Thank to the show. You. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure for us to have you. Uh, before we start, let's uh, give a better, um, uh, if you will, uh, a story from sure. you to our audience. Yeah, sure. Um, in, on August 1st, 2012, I went into the hospital for a routine hysterectomy. And um, history, hysterectomies are very common throughout the United States. Um, about 600,000 women have hysterectomies per year. I had never had a surgery, um, despite the fact I've had two kids. They were both natural, naturally born. Um, and so I was a little nervous going into the hospital, um, but I had talked to so many friends and family members who had had hysterectomies that I didn't really give it a thought. Um, so I went in on a Wednesday, um, expecting to get out the next day on Thursday. Um, they keep you overnight for observance, but it's, like I said, it's a pr pretty common practice. Um, so uh, I went into the surgery when I got out, um, the doctors gave my husband the thumbs up that everything went well. Um, but however, later that day, I started feeling some pain throughout my body and wasn't quite sure, but of course they keep you overnight. Um, so the next day, the pain was progressively getting worse. Um, so the doctors thought, well, perhaps she has gas from the anesthesia. And so the nurses uh, started walking me around the hallways like they do pregnant women. Um, just trying to alleviate some pain um, and get some of the gas out of the system. Um, so later that evening when I was in bed, it continued to get worse. And I called my husband and I, I said, you know, um, they did keep me overnight an extra night after, since the pain was getting worse. So that evening, the second evening when I called my husband, I said, you know, I, I'm not feeling good at all. I think there's something seriously wrong. And he said, well, you have an extra night there. Just take care and try to have a good evening. Um, the next thing I remember was being on the floor in the bathroom on my hands and knees and just throwing up and then having diarrhea and throwing up again. Um, it was just unbelievable, the pain and the nausea and everything I was experiencing. Uh, so I went back to bed and I told the nurse and they gave me something to help me sleep. Um, the next day, uh, my husband was taking our children uh, to summer school, summer camp, and the doctor called him and the doctor said, how far are you from the hospital? And, he, and my husband said, I should be there in about 10 or 15 minutes and he says why and the doctor basically said because we've got to take a net to the ICU um it's 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 not looking well we think uh we cut her colon during surgery and not knowing a lot my husband thought well shoot you know just fix it right and they said no we think she may have sepsis so he got to the hospital and he said it looked like a steam from ER. There was like 10 doctors and nurses all around me. And I was sort of in and out of consciousness by that time. And I do remember 
seeing him at the foot of my bed and us locking eyes, not really knowing what was going on. And so immediately they took me into ICU. Um, and then when the doctors came out, they told my husband that I was probably gonna have to wear an ileostomy bag for the next four or five months, um, but that they weren't even sure if I was gonna make it that long. And he couldn't understand what had happened. And they basically confirmed that they had cut my colon during surgery. And what we found out later through going through um, law proceedings was that that evening that I was on my hands and knees the night before, that the doctors ordered an enema. So in essence, I had a cut colon and then an enema, which just spewed everything back out into my system. Even though I had cleaned properly for the surgery, um, it had just dispelled throughout my body. And so sepsis had immediately set into my body. And had they caught the cut colon within 24 to 40 hours, I might have been okay. Um, but since they waited almost two days before they caught the actual um, error, um, it just went into an immediate sepsis. Um, so after that, I was placed into a medically induced coma, which I was in for four months. And during that time, um, a myriad of doctors had come to see me. At one point, we even went to Long Beach Memorial where they have, um, I don't know if you're familiar with hyperbaric chambers, um, but Long Beach Memorial has a set of hyperbaric chambers, which you are rolled into these glass chambers and they give you fresh air. Uh. It's like being on top of, you know, the highest mountain. And a lot of uh, patients that have had burns and whatnot go through these hyperbaric chambers to help with their skin. Mm -hmm. So they were hoping that because the sepsis was so severe, it had caused necrotizing fasciitis, which is sort of like a flesh eating bacteria that causes burns. So after a week in the hyperbaric, they took me back over uh, to Torrance Memorial burn unit um, where they immediately started to flush out my skin because I had basically become a burn victim. So they were trying to take out the bad skin and replace it with all sorts of other skin grafts. Um, and what they did is they used my back because my back did not have the burns. Mm -hmm. So they used the back of my back for the grass in addition to other types of um, artificial skin grafts, um, pig skin and whatnot, because my whole body, 50% of my body had been burned. So they were trying to use the other 50% for the skin grafts and whatnot. It still wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. um, also during that time, um, the ends of my limbs were beginning to darken because they were giving me these medicines called pressors and pressors, excuse me, take out, um, what they do is they bring the, um, hold on, no worries. I'm having a, a difficulty, a technical issue here. Okay, sorry about that. Um, pressors are medicines that take the blood within your system and they rush it to your vital organs so that your vital organs don't fail. But what happens is your limbs lose the blood there because it's rushing to your internal organs. So mm -hmm. the limbs begin to basically start to die. And so after a month or so, you could see where the darkened skin, it was almost like a demarcation of the skin on the limbs mm -hmm. um, where those were just dying um, to save 
my internal organs. So essentially what it had become to was that they had to um, amputate all four limbs during that time. Um, I was probably supposed to die about five or six times um, during that process. Um, it was to a point where our children who were six and 12 at the time uh, were also told that their mommy um, had to have her limbs amputated and with the hopes of saving her life, but that she still might not make it. Um, so it was pretty dire, um, but for some reason um, I kept on and about four months later is when I woke up from the coma. And um, the first thing, of course, I looked around and I didn't know where I was. And I just saw white, which was the white of my blankets and sheets on my bed. And um, the first thing I tried to do was get up, of course, of which I was just anchored to the bed, basically. Um, and I do remember, it's funny that this is the week of Thanksgiving, because that is the week that year in 2012 that I actually woke up. Wow. Um, so That's it's amazing. kind of a bit surreal. <laughs> have some days during the year that always come to mind, like August 1st, which is when I went in. And then the week of Thanksgiving is when I woke up. And um, it was also the first time that my husband brought the kids in. They had been visiting me, but I couldn't talk or... I was in the coma, but I did have um, a tracheotomy and they took the trach out, which allowed me to speak. So that week the kids visited and my husband said, um, say hi to mommy. And they came in, hi mommy, hi mommy. And they said, tell mommy to say hi back. And they said, daddy, you silly, mommy can't talk. And that's when I said, hi you guys, I love you. I, I woke it up. That's so, um, so after that, it was still um, a myriad of skin grafts and other surgeries at the Torrance Burn Unit in California. Um, and then um, about within nine months, um, I had progressed to a level where they felt I should be able to endure physical therapy. So uh, they transferred me to Long Beach Memorial back again uh, because they have a very good physical therapy unit. Um, I started physical therapy there. Um, I still had the ileostomy bag, which proved to be very challenging during physical therapy because sometimes it would burst open during therapy, um, not a pleasant sight. Um, but there were a lot of other things that were going on too. My skin graft started to break down. Um, additionally, my knee had gotten um, a severe infection, my right knee. And to this day, I can probably only bend it about 80%. There was a deep hole in my knee, which they had to eventually fill with skin grafts. Um, but that was another issue that was going on. So because of all these things happening, physical therapy became, you know, just too difficult to bear. So they transferred me up to the fourth floor at Long Beach, which is the, um, uh, the floor that, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact name, but it was the wound unit where patients with very severe wounds would get treated. So um, I was there predominantly because of skin grafts. So they were trying to save the skin grafts that I had, but at the same time, replace them with other skin grafts. So again, multiple surgeries and uh, multiple things going on. Um, but after a year at Long Beach Memorial and um, all the various things that went on, um, I finally was able to go home um, in April of 2014. So I'd spent nearly two years um, within hospital care. Um, and even after I got home, I still had to go back to the hospital because I got uh, MRSA 
um, which is an infection you can get um, from having too much medications in your body. So you end up catching something else that you might've had in the hospital, but resurfaced. Mm -hmm. um, I had uh, fallen and broken my left limb <laughs> in physical therapy. So I had to go back and you know get that fixed. I fell out of bed <laughs> once, which I broke my hip and had to go back to the hospital. Now I have to sleep with a baby guard Otherwise, <laughs> I don't want another broken hip. Um, so, you know, all in all, over two to two and a half years in a variety of medical care, hospitals, and surgeries. Um, and so I remember when I left Long Beach Memorial, I'd become very close to a doctor who was the head of plastic surgery there, who has since retired, Dr. James Wells. And I remember him sitting me down and saying, okay, we're gonna release you in the next couple of weeks. And um, you are gonna have to start reinventing yourself. And I said, well, I, I don't quite understand what you mean. He goes, well, you know, you're not gonna have your former jobs anymore. You're going out with a completely different body. So you have to start thinking about what you wanna do for yourself, um, either, you know, volunteer, or you have to start thinking about um, how you're going to get around in the house and outside of your house. Um, so there's a lot of things for you to think about. He said, the first thing I think you should think about is getting a service dog. And I thought, oh, you know, I've always had dogs in my life. I love dogs. We didn't had one at that time. And I said, a service dog. Hmm. And coincidentally, um, my physical, my one of my therapists had made me a stylist that attaches to my limb. And that has allowed me to be able to communicate um, um, online or answer phone calls or do whatever I need to do. I've become pretty proficient at it since then. But uh, I was on Facebook for the last, you know, few months after he, he made this little gadget for me. So one of my friends that I had worked with up in Berkeley um, said, you know, uh, she wrote me, she says, you know, I've been following your story and um, I have a new job. And she says, uh, I work for Canine Companions for Independence. And I really think one of our service dogs might be a good addition to your new life outside the hospital. Oh my gosh, two people in the same week told me the exact same thing. So I thought, you know what? I think the somebody up above or something is trying to tell me that the service dog is gonna be in my future. So I thought, well, what the heck? She sent me all the paperwork, which was a lot because I had to get a lot of the doctors to fill out paperwork. Um, like, am I mentally intact? You know, all sorts of things. And it was really easy because they were all there. I didn't have to like call them and say, can you fill these out? All my doctors were there. Absolutely. So yeah, very easy to fill all that out. I actually sent in the paperwork while I was still in the hospital. So that was something to look forward to. Um, so when I got out in April, 2014, as I said, uh, we had had to move because our old house uh, was a two story. Mm -hmm. um, so my husband had to look around for a new house um, that was one level. So not only was I moving into kind of a new life, I was moving into a new house because we had been in our old house for 20 years, um, but we still stayed within the same community. So I was glad we didn't move out of kind of the immediate area. So you've been in Manhattan Beach for a long time? I'd been in Redondo, oh, Redondo. Um, which is basically right across the street from Manhattan Beach. Yeah. We live in East Manhattan Beach. Okay. And we were in North Redondo. So um, literally in the same area now for over 30 years, um, originally from the East Coast, but moved out to California in the late eighties. Um, so moved into the new house. Um, it was 
really strange being in this body, being in a wheelchair, um, facing the public. And, you know, I'd had a pretty social job. I was in alumni relations for both UC Berkeley and uh, my last job was reunion director for USC. Um, so being out in the public was never an issue, speaking in public, whatever else, meeting new people, interfacing with volunteers and donors, but in a whole different body. Um, and I recall, you know, just my first visit to a mall was uh, first navigating everything from a wheelchair, having been able-bodied my whole life, and then all of a sudden being in a wheelchair. I mean, you think of people in wheelchairs, and I had friends in wheelchairs and that had disabilities, but all of a sudden it's a you. And my tr first trip to a mall, I just felt like everybody was staring at me because not only was I in a wheelchair, but I had no limbs. And um, I felt like little children were afraid to approach me and they were like pointing at me and talking to their parents. And then their parents wasn't quite sure what to say um, and then also little children would come up to me and say, hey, you know, how did that happen? Why is your arm like that? What happened to your legs? You know, um, so, and then the parents think, <laughs> and so that was a little strange. Well, which one, if you don't mind me asking, what do you prefer? You prefer someone asking you or you, you know? You know, um, I prefer somebody to ask me. And especially since I've had Patch, my service dog, mm -hmm. which I got in 20, I got Patch in August of uh, 2016. So I was without him for two years. Um, now that I have Patch, I would prefer people to come up to me because not only can I talk about my disability, um, but I can talk about service animals and I can tell them about canine companions and I can talk to children just about being disabled and not being afraid of people with disabilities. And um, some of the parents, um, they, they almost get nervous when their children come up to me, but then I, I try to reassure them. And I know it's awkward don't get me wrong. I mean, you don't often see a quad amputee in a wheelchair and a service dog walking around the mall. I mean, I'm not hard to miss. But um, at first, maybe I was a little nervous about it. But now that I have Patch, it, it all seems right. It seems like I'm educating the public about disabilities. I'm educating the public about service animals. Um, so I feel like it's a sense of purpose now. Um, I never in a million years thought growing up and doing all the things that I've done um, in my quote unquote previous life that I would ever be in a wheelchair without arms and legs. But reinventing myself as Dr. Wells told me to do, I think that's part of my mission in life now. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, when you uh, when you talked about Dr. Wells's uh, advice and reinventing yourself, I think uh, that was that was the the best advice you could have gotten, right? Yeah, and you know he has become my mentor, and um, he still he bugs me all the time. You need to do a TED talk. He tells me that all the time. Yeah, I, I, and I <laughs> I agree with him. I think you should. No, uh, maybe one day. Um, <laughs> I have done some things that I can't believe that I have done or that could ever happen to me, such as I now volunteer for an organization called Consumer Watchdog. Um, and they basically look after consumers' rights. And in my situation, it's patients' rights. And uh, back in um, 2013, there was a proposition on the ballot that year um, to be voted on. We're going to get to that. 
Okay. Is this, is this about the uh, $250,000? Yes. Okay. Yeah. We're going to get to that. But before that, uh, I want to go into a little bit that uh, mindset, ch mindset change, because obviously when you woke up and came back home, you know, your life was like 180 degrees different, right? Mm -hmm. And you yeah. spent, you said about two years, two and a half years in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So you didn't really, you know, you were away from quote unquote normal life. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, so what did it take for you? And I tried to ask everyone that comes on the show with me, you know, and I, I usually uh, interview people with disabilities. So, and usually the people with disabilities that I interview, they were, you know, able body for a long period of time. And then all of a sudden they got into an accident or what, whatever the situation may be mm -hmm. that changed their life. And I think it's very important to uh, highlight the, the, the mental toughness and that mindset change. And how did you get used to your new life now as you're reinventing yourself? You know, now that the other, and I always, I always say that your life or your life now and, you know, in the future is not dependent on your past. So take us through that mindset. How did you adapt? How did you change? I'm, I'm pretty sure it was tough, but what can you tell us about that? Um, I think that um, it's unfortunate what happened um, being in hospital care for, you know, over two years. But in retrospect, I think having that time to adopt to a new body, it gave me that resolute mindset of, okay, this is who I am now. Um, I think if, if I had had this happen and I had to go back out, you know, within, hang on another weird technical thing here. No problem. Sorry. Okay. Um, I think it gave me time to really process. Mm -hmm. So uh, the two years, basically, it was like, a, like an internship for you, if you will. Exactly. Yeah. And I, you know, I was still meeting a lot of people. I met, I don't even know how many nurses and doctors. And um, I, I do think it gave me um, the time to wrap my arms around or my head mm -hmm. um, before I went out. Now, mind you, um, I was almost, uh, when I got out, it was difficult to not have that mentality of being in the hospital. In other words, you know, there were nurses and doctors that took care of me 24 seven. And I was coming, you know, back to a house with my, my children who were then, um, but 14 and, and eight. yeah, 14 and eight. Yeah. Um, not being around them for two years, mm -hmm. kind of being by myself. Um, so it was a whole new getting used to type of environment. Um, right. and, and then with a wheelchair, um, again, I, I'm, I'm just glad I had that time. But I think having somebody like Dr. Wells and also some of the nurses in the hospital that I had, and also I had um, a psychiatrist um, who visited me like every other day and sort of asked me tough questions and, and helped me through that. Having all that care set me up for having the mindset to come home. Although it didn't take away from being afraid of failure or of having something again break down in my body to take me back. Um, so there was that, that fear. But after I kind of got out for a bit, after I gained my confidence, which Patch was a big part of bringing that confidence back to me because having him by my side, they saw this beautiful white lab golden retriever mix. I love golden dog. 
first instead of my disability. Because then the kids were gravitating towards Patch, not gravitating towards me because they were scared of me. Yeah. That that really helped my mindset. Mm -hmm. Um so I hope that answered your question. It it did. It did absolutely. Um and I'm I'm a dog person. I've I've grown up with dogs. Uh and my uh you know I only had German shepherds. I have oh. one right now. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I, uh, golden retrievers is uh, one of the ones that I, I, I love a lot. Yeah. Um, so yeah. is patch the name of the dog or yes. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. that's, that's patch. wonderful. Yeah. That patch wonderful. the third. He, the th there's been three other patches before they have a naming system at CCI. Ah, I see. Yeah. The, the litters are named after a letter of the alphabet. Mm -hmm. And so he happened to be in a P litter, hence Patch. But the reason they called him Patch is both of his parents were black and the whole litter came out black, except for the first dog, which came out white, which was Patch. So all his litter mates were black. So they called him the Patch of White in the Black Litter. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I like the naming convention um let's uh, so let's go into this uh this law right now and i'm gonna shuffle the questions a little bit so 55 years ago apparently there was this california politicians that set up uh, a cap on the damages that compensated patients such as yourself for all they had lost due to medical negligence correct that's correct at two hundred fifty thousand dollars. correct and this hasn't been changed for the past 55 years. It didn't right. even adjust for inflation. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, so what, what are we doing today to change that? Okay, well, as I mentioned previously, there was a ballot, um, uh, a proposition on the ballot back in 2014. Mm -hmm. And um, I never knew about this law, of course, never being disabled or being in a, a medical negligence case, you learn a lot, yeah. um, obviously. Um, so uh, Senator Ted Lieu and a few people from Consumer Watchdog actually came to visit me in the hospital because they had heard of my case. And um, they told us about this egregious law um, that's old, that definitely needed to be updated. Um, and when I heard about that and they asked me to participate, I said, I will do whatever I can um, because obviously um, I'm alive from all this and I'm alive for a reason. And maybe this is another purpose of reinventing myself. Um, so basically I did some interviews back then um, and uh, was in a video um, did a lot of volunteering speaking, but unfortunately, um, the ballot failed. Um, so speed up to today, um, we have a ballot that will be on the 2022, we have a, a proposition, excuse me, um, the Fair Patients Act, it's FIPA, F-I-P-A, Fair Injury Patients Act that Consumer Watchdog will have on the 2022 ballot to be voted on. And um, we are asking um, the cap of $250,000 to at least be raised for inflation purposes, at least at a minimum, and possibly more depending on how egregious the um, negligence was, mm -hmm. um, which in my case was, was pretty bad. But in going through our lawsuit, I found out that people like myself who have had careers um, and have worked for a long time, they can look at how long you've worked, how much they think you're gonna earn, um, all of those different factors. Um, in addition to the actual pain and injury, which is what this is all about. It's your 
your pain and injury, your suffering is where they have capped the $250,000. Um, like I said, if you've worked, they can figure out how long maybe um, you're going to live, how much you might make, how much your retirement might be, and they can come up with a certain value. But let's take, for instance, a child that's five years old that goes into the hospital and um, medical negligence occurred and he was maimed or he was severely brain injured. Well, at five years old, how can you even think about how much this child, who, who is this child going to be when he grows up? Absolutely. How much is he going to make? So all they can really fight for is the pain and suffering that this child not only went through, but will go through the rest of his or her life. Um, or think about the single mom mm. who is working two jobs to support her family and one of her children gets injured or her husband gets injured um, and he's 20 years old and they're just out of college or just, you know, working yeah. a job. I mean, how much can they even think that this person is going to make? Well, this cap needs to be raised for a number of different reasons, not just for, you know, someone like me, but for disadvantaged um, individuals or youth um, everything that I've just spelled out for you. Yeah. So let me let me ask you, and uh, you can uh, choose not to answer this question if it bothers you. Uh, I was going to ask you, like, roughly, how much did it cost for you? Like surgery? You said you changed homes, right? Uh, other other stuff that were you know you had to change around your life. Like, if you had to put a number around that, what would it be? invaluable <laughs> exactly okay that's, no a fair, that's, that's, a fair, that's a fair answer <laughs> that's a very fair answer uh, which uh, you know proves proves the point that uh, 250k actually they're not pay, they're not even paying for maybe uh, uh hospital coverage right right that's right um i mean a reporter from the la times um sort of asked me that same question for an interview um about this exact question. And I said, how much pain and suffrage is two years in the hospital, not being with your children, not being with your family yeah. um, for holidays, for birthdays, for soccer games, in addition to um, all the pain and suffering that I personally went through and then coming out of a normal everyday surgery and not walking, oh, excuse me, I can't walk at all, out of the front doors of a hospital after two years. You just can't even put a price on that alone, much less the rest of my life and what, what that's gonna cost with new prosthetics. Uh, because as you know, uh, we grow in and out of prosthetics and they are not cheap. Yes. Uh, I know. That's, <laughs> and that's uh, so uh, our company, uh, it's a new company. So what we're doing is we're going to uh, hopefully try to come up with innovative technology that is affordable, one and efficient for use purposes. Right. And we're not there yet, but it's a work in progress. Sure. We're also advocating for inclusion in the workplace, meaning, um, you know, hiring people with disabilities when you can. Right. Um, so now that you mentioned the prosthetics, let's talk about all the different equipment and devices that you used, uh, and you know, what, what were the challenges or the benefits? Yeah. Um, I think the hardest thing with the first leg prosthetics that I used, um, were that they were extremely heavy and bulky. And then if the fit isn't right, it's not worth having the prosthetic. Mm -hmm. So even trying to get the perfect fit, particularly in my case, because I have skin grafts on my legs. So you have to make sure that the bottom of your stump fits well within the prosthetic. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, as you probably know, um, your limbs change 
over the years. Sometimes they're bigger, smaller, um, and they don't always fit within the prosthetic. And hence, you have to look at a, either a change in prosthetic or what I have had to do is uh, actually reamputate my stumps because when they initially amputated them, they were doing it to save my life, not yeah. thinking about prosthetics. Yeah. So my initial leg limbs um, were, excuse me, this technical thing. No I don't know why that's doing that. Um, my initial limbs were very pointed and the back of the limb was sort of carved out because they were getting the infection out of my skin. Mm -hmm. So it took, it was a real challenge getting me initially into prosthetics, um, leg prosthetics, that is. Um, I did have one uh, left arm prosthetic that was horrendous. Now we're talking about back in 2013, there's been a lot of changes since. Yeah. Um, it was extremely heavy and bulky, and I, I could barely move my arm in it. Um, now I had not had a lot of physical therapy to try to work up to it, but hence it was still very difficult. Mm -hmm. Um, after the first set of legs, I had heard about another company called bio designs, which is in Westlake village. Um, I heard that they had a different, um, mechanism. It wasn't the, um, please refresh my memory. I had a pin and lock. Okay in my first set of legs, which is basically like a screw at the bottom mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of the prosthetic yep. and then a hole within the leg that it just basically falls into. Um, very challenging because if you don't get um, the actual screw, the bottom of um, the device into mm -hmm. the hole into the leg, then it, it, it takes you forever yeah. to sometimes find it. Um, and they were starting to really scar up the bottom of my legs and I couldn't wear them any longer. So hence I found, about, found out about bio designs um, in Westlake Village that had this different mechanism where they use suction um, within the actual um, what do you call those? Um, the, the sleeve, mm -hmm. the sleeve that you put on your prosthetic, yep. they have like a suction mechanism that goes around and it's more of a suction mm -hmm. as opposed to a pin within the actual prosthetic. Um, so I went to them and have been very successful with my leg prosthetics that I'm doing a lot of um, physical therapy and walking, um, doing things that I never thought I would be able to do in terms of being on my feet. Yeah. Um, with, with that suction. And you're on a wheelchair right now, correct? I am on a wheelchair. Um, until I really get proficient with a set of arms. Excuse me. No worries. Hold on. Cancel. Cancel. I have a lot of talking mechanisms in my house that do I, the greatest things. <laughs> I would accept that. I would I would definitely I was waiting for that. Yeah. <laughs> but it sometimes as I'm talking or if the television is on, it'll start asking me, what do you want? Like, yeah, do you want yeah. light on? Do you want I apologize for that? No worries, no worries. Um, all kinds of technical issues with me over here today. Um <laughs> so the suction mechanism has been great with me walking. Until I'm proficient with either one or both arms, it's very difficult to keep balance mm -hmm. um, because you use your arms, yeah. believe it or not, for a lot of your balance, as you probably know. Um, so I, even though I can walk um, and do different things, I need to have somebody close by because as I mentioned previously, um, with my old physical therapist, I actually fell and broke my left limb um, yeah. because he wasn't right there. I, I thought I was so 
great kicking the soccer ball around, you know, and, and being really cool. And I just accidentally slipped on a grass, fell back, you know, so right. the, your arms are very important. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Absolutely. They are. And, uh, and thank you for giving us that. Uh, you're giving us all sorts of education today. Uh, I think I, I became a doctor during the first uh, portion of your, <laughs> of your I think of your I've talk. already earned my doctorate, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> you are? I feel like it after all the medical procedures oh, I see, I see. that well, I've been through. I might as well be a doctor with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am applying for my doc, doc, uh, doctorate as well. That's fantastic. Uh, in biomedical engineering. So if I get in, I'll let you know. Perfect. <laughs> Um, so, um, I was, so have you heard of universal design? You know, I, I bought your book and I still haven't read it, but I did read, um, the intro and so, but please tell me more about it. So, uh, well, thank you for buying the book. Uh, first of all, uh, please uh, give me your honest review when, when you I have don't. finished it. Uh, so universal design is the is uh, the design of products and the built and our built environment uh, to be aesthetic and usable to the greatest extent possible by everyone, regardless of their age, ability, or status in life. So that's in short what universal design is, and uh, this has been brought forward in uh, the nineteen late nineteen sixties, I believe, by uh, Ronald Mace. Okay. Uh, and he was a wheelchair user. And, uh, you know, basically he uh, came to the conclusion that our environment, our products are not built for everyone. They're just right. built for able-bodied people, right? Mm -hmm. And I was interviewing another person last week who was a wheelchair user and he used to be an able-bodied person, broke his neck, right? Yeah. And um, now he's in a wheelchair. He was telling his experience about when he went to see the Hoover Dam and the viewing area, he couldn't see anything. Uh, they didn't think about, you know, making that accessible for wheelchair users. Mm -hmm. So he was telling me how the, the trip was a bust, right? He didn't oh. enjoy it. So, uh, so when you um, started your new life, how, you know, what did you... How, how did you uh, manage, you know, your environment, the tools that you're using? Uh, what was difficult? Did you partner up with a company that made things easier for you? Mm -hmm. Tell us about that experience. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the biggest thing for me was not being able to drive. And living in Los Angeles, as you well know, um, our public transportation is not always the best. Mm -hmm. Although I will say as part of my therapy at the hospital um, in Long Beach, they took me on their, their subway system or their track system to help me navigate being in that type of environment. Mm -hmm. So I became familiar with that in that regard. Um, but number one, not being able to drive. I um, have a wonderful church um, that had a fundraiser for us. And with their help, I was able to get um, a van with a ramp that allows me now to have my wheelchair going up into the ramp of the van and then lock within the passenger side so that anybody, my husband or whoever can drive the van can take me in where I need to go. So um, definitely through Mobility Works, I believe it's called. Um, they make those vans. I'm sure there are other companies, but I really don't know how, how I could get along without that van. Mm -hmm. But again, unfortunately, it, they are very costly. They are between 80 and $90,000 brand new. So we were pretty fortunate that our church, you know, had that fundraiser, which paid for nearly half of that van. Um, but again, that's not something that even could be covered. Again, going back to that pain and negligence or pain and suffering, um, you have to come up with those monies. Yeah. Um, so that made my life very much better. 
um, obviously having my legs and being able to wear them at home and get up and go to the restroom, even though I do need help in everything that I do, at least I can get up, walk there and, and go to the bathroom. Um, so that made life easier. Um, obviously my, my little stylist guy helped me be, um, helped me to communicate with the world, which has been fabulous because I've been able to volunteer and do the things for consumer watchdog, do the things with canine companions that I absolutely love to do because I was, you know, in my past, I was an event planner, uh, alumni relations as well but helping them to plan fundraising events and do all of those things. So I can do that without the stylus because it helps me, you know, on the phone, on the computer, it helps me when I want to write something. Mm -hmm. Um, So this made my life very much easier. Um, The other things were, and I'm still struggling with, I do have my arms And I started working with my left arm, which is easiest because it has an elbow. I see. I have an elbow. Yeah, so the the shorter the the shorter the arm, the harder it gets, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So this one I started to become pretty proficient in, and I was doing little things, picking up a cup or um, in therapy, you know, grabbing a bag and putting it on, you know, various things. Um, but getting used to the weight and then I have, um, the, the prosthetic where I can move the fingers, um, but not always reliable. Mm -hmm. So I might have something, but then it'll drop because either I lose energy or it starts to slip out of the prosthetic. So this Uh, is through sensors connected to your muscles, correct? Yeah. It's an eye limb. Yeah, mm-hmm. on an island. Yeah. Um, so I started getting pretty proficient and then the pandemic hit. So I haven't been going to physical therapy since March. Yeah. Um, now the right arm is, I haven't even, well, I hope my, pro, my process, this is going to be mad at me. I haven't really started working on it because it's difficult to put on. It's very, very, very heavy because it has an elbow joint yeah. within it. As you know, those can be very heavy. And then the forearm, uh, again, because of the weight of it, it, the forearm basically goes down. I can't mm. really use it yet to do much else. At this you, can, you can grab things with that stylus side of arm thing, right? I can't grab it. You can't grab I can it. I okay. only touch screen with oh, it. Oh, I see. So unfortunately, so, so. I can't grab anything. So my follow-on um, question would be, if someone would have offered you um, like a simple mechanism to grab things instead of having a hand? I did have hooks okay. for a while. Um, they just, they didn't work for me. Because well, hooks like hooks, hooks like that when you can hook on like something. Like a pirate hook. Yeah. For the, <laughs> and <laughs> so they fashioned it where um, I had something that went over my shoulders. Um, I had like a, a strap around my back and around my upper arms mm-hmm. so that I could push control as I brought them forward. The hooks would open. Uh, I see. Um, they were somewhat successful. I'm originally a right-handed person, but I was able to use this hook to write a little bit. Okay. They became very uncomfortable. Um, my shoulders would ache. My back would ache mm-hmm. because of the weight. And I couldn't wear them for very long. And I, and I couldn't wear them under clothes. It, it had to be over top of whatever I was wearing I see. Which, on an everyday basis. That's fine. But if you're going to, you know, a gala or a fundraiser and you want to dress nice and yeah. look nice, it didn't really 
matched with my attire very well. <laughs> yeah, looks like um, we have a lot of work to do. Yeah, we have a lot. Of <laughs> I think the biggest thing that I miss is not being able to feed myself. Okay. Um, and and that is sort of you know something to work towards. Um, that and also just being able to go to the restroom by myself. Mm -hmm. Those two things. Um, Got it. But, if somebody offered me a very cost-effective mechanism, even for this arm that doesn't have an elbow, if it's like some kind of, I'm not sure, power hook that I could open and close, mm -hmm. or um, I just think that would make my life a little bit easier. I'd be able to pick up a fork maybe, but the problem is without an elbow, I probably have to do it with my left yeah. arm. So, so the reason I asked that question is because one of the programs, the doctorate programs that I applied for is called Simple Hands Project. And okay. the sim Simple Hands Project is basically like uh, an end effector. They call it end effector. And so instead of your fingers and, and palm, you have, let's say two or three things that you can wow effectively grab things right oh uh, nice. so it's it's a, it's a lot more simple to control those than a, a, a hand because believe it or not our hand is our most complicated if you compare it to a robotic system it's one of our most complicated parts of our body yes so, i actually learned that um, because when they did my arm amputations, we talked, or my husband talked with many specialists before amputating. I think there was a doctor from UCLA that came out in the events that one day I wanted to get fit for actual human arms. Mm -hmm. They made sure that certain nerves were still intact. Yeah before they amputated. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole other road that I don't think I want to go down. There's a lot of, um, with the medicines, there's a lot of not only bad reactions, but it could lower your lifespan from what I understand. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh. So this was uh, great. Thank you for all the information. You're welcome. No, thank uh, you. I hope, I, I hope you had fun. I know it was, well, you know, <laughs> visiting um, my journey through Oz is not always easy, I know. but um, seeing who the wizard is at the end and there is a light at the end of the tunnel, you don't, just because you lose your limbs doesn't mean you lose your life. Absolutely. You have to look at it in that way. Absolutely. As I said, our past does not determine our, our life ahead. And uh, you, you survived for a reason. And I think you should uh, live that reason. I, I am trying the best I can. I'm getting to see my kids grow up. I'm meeting some fabulous people through Canine Companions and doing work for patient advocacy. And I don't know what else lies ahead, but well, I'm definitely looking towards that path. Yeah, definitely. And what lies ahead is always great things. Yes, I agree. And good luck to you. I'm Thank going to you. follow you Thank and you uh, see how you do and see what you come up with. Well, uh, I uh, will not disappoint. I hope not, because I'm <laughs> looking forward to a lot of great things to come, especially for my arms. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate, appreciate it. Appreciate it. So that is, uh, you know, thank you very much, Annette. I want to thank welcome. you for your time. You're uh, welcome. I want to thank everyone who tuned in and listened to us. I will post this interview uh, on my website, markingrobotics.com. I will post it on Facebook again. Uh, I will let you know when I post it. Thank you. Uh, and that's it for today. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you next time with a new guest and a new challenge to overcome. Great. Thanks a bunch. Thank you. Talk to you Bye. soon. Bye. Bye.